What happened to us? You, me, the world? For those who have been following me for quite some time, you may remember that I actually reviewed this show before. It was back in 2016, the summer before the election. And I think one thing that we can all agree on, left, right, and everything in between, is that that was a different world. A different life, almost. I reviewed The Good Family originally because I thought it was the best way to talk about certain issues that I was afraid were on the rise. Namely, about the political divisions that were, at the time, coalescing. If you didn't get that out of my original review, I don't blame you. It wasn't very good. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. To put things more to the point, I want a do-over. Especially since The Good Family is one of those shows that manages to be completely different, despite staying completely the same. So let's talk about it. The Good Family is one of the more obscure works by Mike Judge. Even if you've never heard that name before, you've probably seen some of his work. He's an actor, animator, writer, producer, director, psychic, musician, voice actor. The guy's had a full life, to the point where it's hard to say what his most famous work is. He's the guy behind the movie's office space in Idiocracy. Even in terms of animation, it's hard to say which is his most famous cartoon. Either be and Butthead or King of the Hill. Do I look like I know what a j is? I just want a picture of a Although the latter is far more relevant to what we're talking about today. When you think of the political leaning of someone in Hollywood, with very few exceptions, they're usually quite left-leaning. That's not really a secret or a critique. Artists, in general, are biased to left-leaning ways of thinking. I think I've called Mike Judge a conservative before, although that might have been inaccurate. This is the guy who made King of the Hill, which was definitely a show about conservative characters. But he also made Beavis and Butthead, which tended to get conservative people in an uproar. Beavis and Butthead was the show that had the whole fire-fire controversy. But as far as I can tell, he tends to keep his own personal and political opinions on the down low. He also says that he denies having political messages in his shows, which is not entirely the truth. Personally speaking, if I had to guess, I think if he had a better understanding of the left side of the political aisle, the good family wouldn't be such hot flaming garbage. So one of the biggest issues with my original review of the show is that I didn't give it many critiques, or at least critiques that made sense. One thing I often said was that it came out way too early, which is true, but that's not a valid complaint. Let's start with something more to the point. This show was poorly made from conception. Watching The Good Family, I felt constantly annoyed and angry. Every single episode just let me retching. And that's not just the episode about the man-eating garbage or the one about the oozing, pulsating rodent. What's the most important aspect of a slice of life show? That would be the characters. The Good Family poses a question. Can you make a good show about characters that you personally hate? And this is the kind of question that proves that yes, there are stupid questions in the world. The titular goods are not good. They are not good people. They are not good characters. Let's begin with Helen. Now, I made it known that I hated Peggy Hill. For a good long time, she was my least favorite character in all of media, because she was a selfish narcissist that did things like get jealous over her son's homemaking abilities, even though she had very limited homemaking abilities herself. Helen is worse. So there's this other character, Margot. She often tries to poke and prod Helen about how good of a person she is, all of the protests and charity work she's doing. It's insufferable virtue signaling to begin with, but Helen always, always, always takes the bait, and only ever does good things not to look good, but to tear down her rival. It's basically watching Twitter be a character on a show, and I don't have the stomach for that anymore. Being good is so hard. It's telling that her best appearance is when she starts yelling and assaulting people because she's obsessed with football. In episode one, she gets drunk because her daughter isn't talking to her about being sexually active. In another episode, she makes friends with two lesbians to prove that she's not homophobic. My favorite example is when she starts graffitiing public property to teach her daughter some kind of lesson about community service. And then she gets angry when she's not getting credit for it, and some kind of narrative thread that I don't even want to get into. In another episode, she abandons her own kids to go focus on some underprivileged youths. Like, I want to make it clear. There are only 13 episodes of the show. I should not be able to list this many awful things in 13 episodes. Gerald isn't much better, besides sounding like Hank Hill with a sinus infection. He's got the same illness. We are not hiring any minorities to do our dirty work. That's racist. It's whites only at the good house. This is in some kind of attempt to not be racist, by the way. In episode 13, he stuffs a squash down his pants. No, I'm not going to tell you why. I think it's funnier if you guess, because unless you've watched the show, you will never figure out why he stuffed a squash down his pants. I watched the show, and I barely only understand why Gerald stuffed a squash down his pants myself. Alright, if you're super, super curious, Gerald 
stuffed a squash down his pants because he wanted to impress the lesbian friends they made to prove they weren't homophobic so he could be a sperm donor so his wife Helen could brag to all of her, uh, let's call them friends. And they thought that stuffing a squash down Gerald's pants would impress their lesbian friends. There's some whatever in there about being a man as well and, uh, impressing his son Ubuntu. Speaking of which, Ubuntu is Chris Griffin. End of story. There's nothing new. I don't know why he here. Also, if you're wondering about the garb, the Goods wanted to adopt a baby from Africa to prove how not racist they are, and they got a white child from South Africa. There's only one joke about him being African American in the first episode, and this is like, not brought up again ever. Well, yes. See, Ubuntu is African American. He's an American now, but he's from South Africa. Except, like, once when Gerald mentions that in his native Africa, upon coming of age, he'd have a scarification ritual, which I'm pretty sure don't happen in South Africa. Bliss is the teenage daughter, and this is one of those things where the passage of time has hurt the show. Like, a lot. Like, if you don't remember this trope, the teenage kid always tried to make the conservative parents go, <laughs> or, That boy ain't right. But what's a teenager supposed to do when your parents accept everything you do? Like joining an eco-terrorism ring. What they thought, and this is actually pretty cute in hindsight, is that the kids would try to be more conservative. Bliss ends up joining a purity ball in episode 1, saying that she's going to be all into abstinence. What actually happened in the real world? Corporations and politicians hijacked Teenage Rebellion. Improve your parents' world by buying our pollution-causing terrible-for-you rainbow-colored sludge. And vote for us to not forgive student loan debt that we told you to get. In the original review, I said that Charlie had Cotton Hill's voice actor. That's not true. That's literally the only thing that he doesn't have from Cotton. It's the same character. I guess minus the veteran stuff. A pompous, politically incorrect womanizer that doesn't give a damn about his kid. Dad, it's collared greens. Right, and it's collared people. And I know what you're thinking hearing me complain about the characters. This is the point of the show. The characters are supposed to be awful. That is one thing that I did get right in my original review, is that the show is mocking these kind of people. And it's not like these people don't exist in reality, either then or especially now. My favorite example of these kind of people is the country band Lady Antebellum. Yeah, you wouldn't expect this kind of shit in country music, but here we are. And Lady Antebellum is, uh, something else. They were most famous for the song Need You Now, back in 2010. That was until the George Floyd protests. You see, Lady Antebellum's name has always been infamous, always been controversial, and there is no way they wouldn't have known about that since they started. Because in the United States, the Antebellum period is what we refer to as the time just before the Civil War. So if you were, say, touring a slave plantation, it'd be called an Antebellum plantation. So the band was touring one of these slave plantations and they thought that's a cool name maybe a ghost lives there named lady antebellum then comes 2020 where they said that they had never sought out the definition of antebellum in the dictionary then they asked some black people what it meant and changed their name to lady a no i'm not kidding that that's their defense unfortunately that name lady a which they still go by now was already taken by an african-american activist musician named anita white so they did what any anti-racist activist would do. They sued her. This minority individual who had been using the name for 20 years. You know, longer than Lady Antebellum even existed. They sued her, just to prove how not racist they were. I know these things happen. These people exist in reality. The Dixie Chicks also changed their name to The Chicks which they then abandoned in 2025 when they learned that the word chicks had misogynistic connotations, something they claimed that they just figured out last Tuesday, and that it was the most vague, stupid band name you could possibly have. And then they renamed themselves to The The, and then they started suing the people who were already going by the name The The. Here's the problem of making a show about these kind of people. The Goods have a dog that they abuse by forcing him to be vegan. Dogs cannot be vegan. If you force a vegan diet on your dog, you are abusing him. The show makes this absolutely clear. This dog, Shay, is being abused. He goes crazy whenever there's another animal nearby. And in one episode, he escapes and finds the owner of a meat-focused restaurant named Cranky. So the episode is about the Goods trying to help Cranky win a chili contest and get their dog back. And they do win, by technicality, and get their dog back, who is now back in an abusive home. Is this supposed to be a happy ending? It's written like a happy ending. Am I supposed to find this dog being abused funny? 
or heartwarming, because it's not. How Che is treated is one of the most grotesque, horrifying parts of the show. Whenever he is on screen, they make it wildly apparent that his life is miserable. This show follows the worst kind of logic when you do a follow-up show. Since we don't want to repeat ourselves, let's do literally the exact opposite thing we did before. Hank Hill loves his dog to the point where he neglects everything else. Let's have this family abuse their dog and be ignorant to it. King of the Hill's color palette is muted, earthen, and easy on the eyes. Let's make this show bright, vibrant, and painful. King of the Hill is good. Let's do the opposite so we don't repeat ourselves. That is the kind of logic that this show was created from. I mean, it still has a similar art style where the characters look a little too real to be cartoon characters. Honestly, though, it's much more uncanny here. Helen especially just looks off. And what really hurts is this show often tries to be more cartoony and expressive. There are these more over-the-top expressions that do not work with a King of the Hill art style. And there are even classic cartoon gags like dashing off in a puff of smoke. And keep in mind, the stories are still written like King of the Hill stories. It's trying to have a similar tone, and it's just bizarre. King of the Hill's dream sequences were more restrained than this. Let's actually go back to King of the Hill for a minute. What was that show about thematically? King of the Hill was about a conservative Texas man trying to adapt to a world that was rapidly changing through technology and new social values. It was about a generational gap more than anything else. Try to find a connection between the more conservative older generations and the more liberal newer generations. The show didn't always succeed, but that's what it was always trying to do. What is The Good Family about thematically? Let's laugh at these people, and at the same time root for them, who think that they're more morally superior than they are. You could definitely make a show like that, South Park does something similar, but you can't do it with the same writing style as King of the Hill, and not without the same understanding as King of the Hill. This is why I did and do tend to assume that Mike Judge is conservative. Whether or not he is, he understands why someone, Hank Hill specifically, might be conservative, and a lot of the conflicts that a conservative person might go through. Mike Judge understood why someone would be conservative, and understood how they'd want to be viewed by an outside audience. Hank is a boring stick-in-the-mud kind of person that has trouble adapting to the new, but at the same time he has strong values. You know he values his family, his job, his country, and especially his dog. It's something that maybe a conservative wouldn't entirely agree with, especially nowadays as the movement is a bit different, but it's not something that they'd argue with. Why would someone be liberal? According to this show, the only reason that anyone would ever be liberal is to be and feel morally superior to their neighbors. Every single liberal character on this show falls into that camp. Every single one. They're naive at best, like Ubuntu once again accidentally joining an eco-terror cell. At worst, their life purpose is to one-up everyone else. It definitely understands the crazier side of the left, but it's missing the more important pieces. A grounding that helps identify reasonable reasons that people might do what these assholes do. Not to be a something or other, but if this kind of show was made with any other group in mind, it would come across as, let's call it, very intolerant. And I'm not talking if it was made with conservatives in mind. I mean if this show was made with anything other than political affiliation in mind. It probably would have been considered one of the most blatantly offensive shows ever made. And well, 10 years on of saying that this kind of stuff is okay, where are we now? This show came out in 2009. That was just about a decade ago. Hell, I reviewed this show originally in 2016, half a decade ago. And at that time, these issues were just becoming noticeable to the mainstream public. Political prejudice has been such an issue that I've been worried about for a very long time because of how destructive and dangerous it is. Tell me if you agree with this statement. During the COVID-19 pandemic, a significant number of people were more focused on their political side than actually getting to the end of the pandemic and minimizing damage. Yeah, of course, it, it's the other side. It, it's always the other side. Only one side is completely responsible for the damage and destruction we've faced. They're always the stupid, selfish idiots that are more interested in following ideology than actually thinking for themselves. Tell me, would anyone here be surprised if a senator just straight up beat another one up with a cane? Like, just walked into the building and attacked another one over a disagreement? I wouldn't be surprised. Things are broken right now. Very broken. No, I wouldn't blame this show for that specifically. It's the logic that created this show that I blame. I personally see this show as an act of prejudice. That's not something that I can say about most other things that I've reviewed, no matter how bad they are. And because of where this prejudice has led us, I find this show absolutely disgusting in ways that I don't find most other shows. The left and the right, no one is above satire. But here's the thing, 
Satire needs a point. Some say the King of the Hill was a satire. In that case, the point was that conservatives need to be more okay with change. As much as Hank said, that boy ain't right. he was frequently, but not always, in the wrong about that. Throughout the series, Bobby turned out fine, and much more open-minded than his father. What is the point of the good family? Beyond, look at the stupids and laugh. Like, here's the thing. This kind of logic and these kind of people, the absolute crazies on the left, do deserve satire. But, tell me here. How could the goods change to be good people? Or at least better people? The only answer that this show provides is, don't be you. Trying to go green, trying to be vegan, protesting, doing community service. Those are all admirable things to do if you're doing them for the right reason. But like I said, everyone in this show is just doing good to one-up everyone else. I mean, if I could force it, don't give dogs vegan diets. On the show, it's often treated as a joke. I reiterate, in the show it's shown as bad when the dog gets the meat it needs to survive. If the show actually had a point, it'd say something like, Vegans that try to make dogs be vegans are hypocrites, claiming to care about nature and instead harming it, wanting to be a part of nature by trying to stand above nature. That's a point. But no, instead of that, we're supposed to be happy when the goods get their dog back and continue to abuse him in future episodes. I want to know, how could Helen Good be a good person while still being Helen Good? I'm not asking for too much here, because that's the kind of effort that was put into King of the Hill. And that's why that show lasted for 13 seasons, why the Good family lasted for 13 episodes. You can't expect people to change, at least in a positive way, when you're insulting them. And in this country, we have got to talk. Like, actually talk! If we don't, I can only see bad things in the future. It's kind of why I've been procrastinating on, like, everything that came out last year. Here's a question. What's the difference between High Guardian Spice and Masters of the Universe? One begins with the letter H, and the other one should have. That's the only difference. Throw Santa Inc. onto that pile, too. These shows are just leftists talking to leftists. That is it. And I've been reviewing that exact same show for years. Remember Let's Not Be Skeletons? It was an anti-gun activist talking to other anti-gun activists. I reviewed this show again, specifically because it's one of the few things that's not that. That's not true. I reviewed this because the world was different last time that I did. For example, back in 2016, cuties did not exist, which is essentially child porn that was defended part and parcel by the left, because the righties didn't like it. It's funny, because the fact that cuties was controversial demolished the claimed point of the movie, where society was encouraging young girls to be sexualized. Back in 2016, as far as I could tell, sex ed teachers weren't using child porn to teach sex ed. Last time I reviewed this show, The Amazing Atheist wasn't arguing that the government should have a Bureau of Censorship, because if they did have a Bureau of Censorship back when he got started, and this was the kind of show that was on the air, he would have been one of the first targets of that Bureau of Censorship. There is nothing more sad in this world than a fallen punk who starts raging for the machine. Back in 2016, established YouTubers like Wisecrack weren't arguing for eco-terrorism. I kind of feel like a parent of two bickering children who are about to stab each other right now. I criticize the left a lot, even in this video. They're in cultural power right now. You got the president, you got the house, you got the senate, you got Hollywood, you got higher education, lower education, you got a lot. And, uh... When the right gets back into power, which isn't an if, it's a when, and when they send the pendulum flying through every single issue important to you, I will be criticizing the right just as harshly, I promise you that. Then again, maybe by then we've actually learned to communicate with one another. Or maybe you'll finally succeed in shutting out literally half of the population from polite society through censorship and dehumanization. Or maybe next time I decide to do this review again, I'll have to differentiate which antebellum period I'm talking about. I'm not a man of faith. I thought that maybe in the past five years I'd grown a taste for this kind of show. But no, it reminds me of literally everything wrong with the world. Hey, you've reached the end of the video. The names scrolling by right now are of all the wonderful patrons who donated to help keep this channel alive. If you'd like your name in the credits, head on over and make a donation yourself. Also, be sure to check out my Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok for exclusive content and previews of my upcoming videos. I've also got a forum where you can discuss anything that has to do with my content and connect with the rest of the community. To find anything that I mentioned, just visit my link tree in the description down below. Lastly, be sure to subscribe, comment, and share this video with your friends. Oh, and thanks for watching. Tell me, would anyone here be surprised if a senator just straight up beat another one up with a cane? Like, just walked into the building and attacked another one over a disagreement. I wouldn't be surprised. Things are broken right now.